in the interest of um, um, keeping Levinas and Derrida separate, let me note one thing here. But Levinas's neologism, illaity, maybe the ill, and eighty, heinous or itness, which like a third personness is what he's talking about. Third personness that's inherent in any other, right? Um, that, that keeps us from simply corresponding um, and being equal. Derrida will come in and say, yeah, yeah, but there's a, a what you can't do with this, I'm making this part up, but what he's getting at is you can't. This is what is not there. You can't say a sheenness. One of Levinas's problems is, a, is gender trouble, right? So Derrida basically says that's something I would never have come up with. Heinous, right? It, at least not without a, a hyphen L A D, right? So that it, he or sheenness or something, right? So in fact, in that piece, that's um. In at this very moment in the text, here I am. That's the name of Derrida's piece. It's a response to, to Levinas. And in it, he's talking about Levinas's gender trouble. And um, and he ends up saying, you know, the problem is that there's you know, there's no there's no L she. And he starts to talk about it like that. EL has a problem with the L. <laughs> May I say something? Yeah. <laughs> you do that beautifully in your book. Thank you. <laughs> Everybody should read the book. I'm not paid for that. <laughs> <laughs> you mean like under the gender? Or for the she um, um, said that. Oh, okay. That's okay, okay. Nice. No, quite, quite the right. Nice. But in any case, I mean, what Derrida would never have done is to turn this third personness into a heinous, mm -hmm. right? It would never have come down to a, a gendered. It's different times, you know. It's different times. That's right. Okay. Um, when was Levinas writing the third person, the uh, third party? Well, yes. Yeah, it's not writing? exactly different. It's not, not. It's not different enough of times. <laughs> <laughs> so, Just wondering. Because it was. Not, it was. Let's see. When did he do yeah, otherwise than being? Otherwise, the being was in the 70s, wasn't no. it? Before it got, I mean, it got translated in the 90s. Uh, maybe. It's, maybe. Well, for us, it's the 90s. So I'm looking it up. Yeah. My, my translation is older, but yeah, I, I think, but his biggest writing is all from no, the... No, it was translated in, in the 80s. 80s, yeah. It's, his biggest writings are from the 60s and 70s, no? 60s, 60s and 70s. This big. is like, I think otherwise, the being is the late 70s. Something like that. Can you look it up? I've yeah. lost my, my sense of time. But I mean, Derek was reading this as it's coming out. Yes, I mean, it's not, yeah, it's not, he, we can't let him off that easy. Yeah. That's true. But let, let's, um, so he's, he's sort of sloppily sexist in, in, his, in this sense, but at the same time, it's not that easy to get him for um, sexist thought because there's a, he keeps a distinction between the feminine position and any sort of empirical woman, right? It's not, so he does, um, he catches some heat that's not quite fair, but I think what Derrida is getting at is that nonetheless there's something there to be wary of, right? Did you find it? Anybody else? Mine is. No, okay. the next book. Ah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's really a touch and go around here at the net, isn't it? Yeah, so, yeah. Oh, it's not okay. Um, yeah, I don't know about how pain. Uh, did you feel the pain when um, Paul Miller and, and Mitchell were presenting, and they they would be right about to show something, and then it was down? I was just like, no, no, no. I just was <laughs> totally <laughs> identified being up yeah. there counting on the technology. Though. Yeah, I mean, I showed girl last year my computer just wasn't working at all. Uh, it would just be on for five minutes and shut down. It's just like, you know, guess what? We have to read some books now. Uh, yeah. and it's like you actually have, have to talk about some ideas, like, yeah. <laughs> and they did fine. When your books are <laughs> it was on, hours. when your books are on it, on the computer, no, I that's why. But that's why I also bought them. Yeah. Me too. Yeah. 
and that's also why they're, why they're small. <laughs> okay, so now um, that first sort of generalized background is first. Second, um, the specific context and situation um, that Derrida was addressing in this, in this um, address. So, background. On May 26, 1993, you may remember this, Algerian writer Tahar Dejout was brutally murdered, assassinated basically, by a funda uh, an Islamic fundamentalist group because, and this is according to one of the assassins who took credit, quote, he wielded a fearsome pen that could have an effect on Islamic sectors, close quote. So, in a kind of rapid response to this tragedy, um, which, you know, was one among many, just the latest one, right, in, this, uh, in a series in, in Algeria, more than 300 writers from around the world responded by signing a petition supporting the establishment of the International Parliament of Writers. That's who he's addressing, the IPW. The IPW met for the first time in Stras Strasbourg in, uh, on February 14, 1994. The significance of that date is, is that it was the um, fifth anniversary of the fatwa against Salman Rushdie. And they met to establish an executive branch, which at the beginning had seven members, which included Rushdie, Derrida, Pierre Bourdieu, and Christian, Christian Solomon, among others. Their founding task was to create the network of cities of asylum. Each city of which would take in and protect riders threatened by fundamentalist or totalitarian organizations. So the fatwa against Rushdie in 1989, um, which commanded Muslims worldwide to go find anyone who was even partly responsible for that book, um, the Satanic Verses, and take them out wherever they are worldwide, had already exposed the particular vulnerability of writers and artists in a global society. And in fact, the, the um, IPW's first two presidents, Rushdie and Wole Soyinka, were, hu were hunted for many years by assassins from Iran and Nigeria, both of which are members of the United Nations. So the harsh fact, Salman writes in his, um, in his description of this, is that we've gone from censorship of works to the persecution of authors from censored texts to beheadings. And most chillingly, he continues, censorship no longer targets political, religious, or ideological opinions, but instead the whole area of representation. A new crime haunts the night of orthodoxies, the crime of creating, of writing, or imagining, the crime of literature. And the murderous persecution of writers and thinkers quote, we're going to continue on, does not constitute the simple violation of individual rights to opinion and expression. The target of such persecutions is anything in writing that sketches out a different world, different kinds of relations among people, giving form and voice to the invention of a different democracy. Close quote. Anything that gives form and voice to the invention of a different democracy, the different relation among people. So what Derrida is noting here, after Arendt and, and um, others, is that, that the state is of almost no help in these situations where um, the targetings are privatized and don't begin with a state organization. So on page six, Derrida writes, whenever the state is neither the foremost author of nor the foremost guarantor against violence which forces refugees or exiles to flee, it is often powerless to ensure the protection and liberty of its own citizens before a terrorist menace, whether or not it has religious or national alibi. International law, Hannah Arendt warned, and this is in the um, Origins of Totalitarianism, is also practically impotent in these cases which the, in which the threatening decree comes neither from a national government nor is restricted to a national territory. 
this is a quote from Arendt, from Arendt, mostly limited to reciprocal agreements and treaties between sovereign states, international law has no real authority over extranational organizations that choose to ignore interstate, interstate legislation. So it's about international law, it's about as much help um, to the endangered rider in this case as it is to other casualties of the nation state system. So refugees, stateless persons, so displaced persons. So rather than champion, than champion some, what Arendt calls sphere that is above the nations or a world government to oversee and protect the specifically human rights um, that current international law can't adequately enforce, the IPW pins its hopes on the city. Um, they're, they're not alone in this. Um, others have turned to the city as a potential way to, um, to fight and protect, uh, fight threats and protect human rights. Um, uh, Agamben is a good example. We can talk about that later if you want. Who um, proposes and means that without ends that um, one response to um, the wars in Israel and uh, Israel and Palestine is to, is to make Jerusalem simultaneously the capital both of Israel and of Palestine with no territorial partitions, so that everyone there is both a citizen and an exile, both a citizen and a, re and, a, and a refugee. So you have to experience both at the same time. Yes. What, sorry? That's hate that utopia. idea. So what, <laughs> what he's suggesting is that there's no need to tie, yeah, there's no need to tie um, these sorts of um, allegiances to soil. So or blood or whatever, but if everyone could feel also their own sense of being a refugee, then what he wants, he would want to start with Jerusalem to begin to think differently about our relation to soil and blood, etc. Okay, so Rushdie served as the IPW's first elected president. And he wrote the, what he called the Declaration of Independence that served as um, the organization's charter. And it sort of formalized its commitment to um, this collective responsiveness. The declaration is a powerful defense of what Kant had, had described as a universal cosmopolitan right, except that whereas Kant had argued that the, the right to visit, this is a quote, the right to visit, to associate, belongs to all men by virtue of their common ownership of the Earth's surface. Rushdie defends the right of all people to visit both actualized countries and countries of the imagination. So this is Rushdie. This is part of the Declaration of Independence. Riders are citizens of many countries, the finite and frontiered countries of observable reality in everyday life, the boundless kingdom of the imagination, the half-lost land of memory, the federations of the heart, which are both hot and cold, the United States of the mind, calm and turbulent, broad and narrow, ordered and deranged, the celestial and infernal nations of desire, and perhaps the most important of all of our habitations, the unfettered republic of the tongue. So according to him, riders deserve special protection because they hold open the doors to um, this heterogeny of countries, both physical and of the imagination. So he writes, today around the world, literature continues to confront tyranny, not politically, not polemically, but by denying its authority, by going its own way, by declaring its independence. Our parliament of riders exists to fight for oppressed riders and against all those who persecute them in their work to renew continually the declaration of independence without which riding is impossible. And not only riding but dreaming, and not only dreaming but thought, 
and not only thought, but liberty itself, close quote. Are these quotes from, from Rushdie, are they on the, uh, the website for that, or is there the collection of books somewhere? Where There's a, um, there, um, we'll talk about the state of these of this organization later on, but there is um, a collection that has the entire declaration in it, and I can get you the title of that. There's also, though, I'm fairly certain that's that, that, that the Declaration of Independence that Rushkey wrote is still on a website. Um, this organization is no longer around, but um, but its its children are. It's off. It's spinoffs. So um, you can still get a hold of the of the text, and you can also write to me, and I'll send it to you. According to Rushdie, Rushdie, the writers of okay, so no, 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 liberty itself. Okay, so taking Rushdie's declaration at it as the charter and inspiration, the IPW established the International Board for the Cities of Asylum, and in collaboration with the Congress of Local and Regional Authorities of Europe, tasked it with four things. They tasked this um, International Board for the Cities of Asylum with drafting a charter for the cities of asylum, setting up a, and running a network of cities of asylum, supplying a list of writers wishing to reside in a participating city to the IPW, and collaborating with the Council of Europe and the participating cities and writers to, quote, push forward the analysis of new forms of citizenship, particularly citizenship based on residence, begun by the International Parliament of Writers, close quote. <clears throat> the following year, 1995, the European Charter of the Cities of Asylum, which specifies the legal and institutional framework for providing asylum to threatened writers, was adopted by the Council of Europe and approved by the European Parliament. Okay, so both of these sort of official charters, Rushdie's for the IPW, and this one for um, the the, um, the cities of asylum, the network of cities of network of cities of asylum, were established and in place by the time Derrida addressed the IPW, the one you have here. Okay, that was in 1996 that he made the address. And yet, in this text, you notice he refers to a new a new charter of hospitality. That's what he calls it, a new charter of hospitality. This new charter, as he describes it, both embraces the IPW's vision for the network and sort of subtly challenges it, especially in terms of its limits and conditions. So there's a question about whether he's referring to one of those charters that's already in place or one he's instituted now, right? this new charter of hospitality. Derrida's new charter requires that the cities situate themselves within the tension between the law and the laws, where decisions take place. So without explicit reference to Rushdie's declaration, Derrida describes the network's um, protection of threatened riders, not as the end goal, but as a path toward a more radically generalized hospitality. <laughs> the fact that any writer, per se, that gets any type of attention at all is just as vulnerable as somebody in a essentially concentration camp on one side of the border, I find completely offensive. I'm not talking about Rushdie and Soinica. <clears throat> you know, it's... Anyway, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's, that's, this is something we're going we're gonna to definitely spend some time talking it's about. It's got to be the roadmap for everybody. So what Derrida does on page four is um, ask par the Parliament of Writers to, quote, make an audacious call for a genuine innovation in the history of the right to asylum or the duty to hospitality, close quote. So describing the protection of foreign riders as an imperative but preliminary goal 
of the network of cities of asylum. He insists that its ultimate goal is not only to promote new forms of citizenship, but to radically reorient nation state politics so that it might eventually protect not only foreign riders, but basically any inscriber of the foreign. So on page four, again, here's Derrida. Whether it be the foreigner in general, the immigrant, the exile, the deported, the stateless, or the displaced person, we would ask these new cities of refuge to reorient the politics of the state. We would ask them to transform and reform the modalities of membership by which the city belongs to the state, as in de a developing Europe or in an international juridical structure still dominated by the inviolable rule of state sovereignty, an intangible rule, or one at least supposed as such, which is becoming increasingly precarious and problematic nonetheless. This should no longer be the ultimate horizon for the cities of refuge, state, the sovereignty of state. So each of these cities, Derrida writes, when dealing with the related questions of hospitality and refuge, must find a way to, quote, elevate itself above nation states, or at least free itself from them, in order to become, to coin a phrase in a new and novel way, a free city free to establish itself as a place to which one could, quote, retreat in order to escape from the threat of injustice. Such might be the magnitude of our task, Derrida proposes, a theoretical task indissociable from its political implementation. This is not what Rushdie wrote, right? Which makes it appear that this new um, charter of hospitality is the one he's inscribing right now, not the one that Rushdie put in place. So up against a backdrop of dwindling international support for the right to political asylum, he challenges cities, these cities, with instituting a new cosmopolitics beyond the sovereignty of nation states. By exercising these sovereign rights that, that they don't currently have in order ex post facto to bring those rights into being. Sounds utopian, but um, don't forget, and we'll get to this in a second, they've already got cities lined up and they've already got a plan in action. It's concrete. Sorry? So it's concrete. So it's, con it's utopian and concrete. Um, as, t as is usual, we're in a, par a sort of paradox. Derrida likes to keep us off balance there. Derrida asked the cities to become welcoming sites that operate as autonomously as possible, as he puts it, while nonetheless remaining allied to each other according to, quote, forms of solidarity yet to be invented. Autonomous as possible, but allied according to forms of solidarity yet to be invented. So the ultimate goal of the IPW, according to Derrida's explication of this new charter, is to actualize a new cosmopolitan solidarity that would ex far exceed anything Kant could have imagined. So, so remaining allied through, but only through, this common charter of hospitality, and so breaking with the nation states, determinate ties to in territorial boundaries, to native soil, and to blood, the network's cities, Derrida proposes, would inscribe new communitarian realities, which he says it is our task to invent and articulate and even to invent by articulating. But, as we were just saying, it's no mere utopian fantasy. As the theoretical and critical reflection it involves, Derrida says, is indissociable from the practical incentives we have already, out of a sense of urgency, initiated and implemented. 
By 1996, several cities had already joined the network. And that's, they, they join. Cities join. They're not like uh, um, drafted. But how, how do cities join? Like, is it the mayor or is it the. Is it how, does, how, does city, how do cities join this? How did they join the mayor, city council? Oh, oh, I see. Where, I um, um, it, it's a, um, it depends on the city, obviously, and how it runs. But typically, like when Austin joined, it had to do with the mayor and the city council. Um, and it was a decision that they made. Same with Strasbourg. I'm not sure how every city is run, but the city itself makes the decision not to, I mean, opt, into it. to opt into it. So it's not like there's any top-down thing going on here, right? The cities join, um, and, and when they do that, it's they're signing on to, um, to the charter, right? Um, to take in, and in, in, any, in any case, they're never, um, they're never appointed some threatened person, you know, writer, mm -hmm. They're not appointed one. They have a list of cities who want to participate, who have signed on, and then they have the list of um, people under persecution. And then there's an invitation to, to make a hookup. And then, I mean, often, probably in Austin, probably put a lot of writers in a college or a university, right? That sometimes, sometimes, sometimes. And each, I mean, each, it depends on who it is and what the threat is yeah. as to what they're going to need. Sometimes they need work. Sometimes they need to hide, really hide. Um, and so, and so, so sometimes they need, like, current, uh, a constant bodily protection, right? Um, so it just depends. And sometimes in cities, they don't have to hide. And in fact, um, you can read about some of these things. Um, they, they have, a city will um, host special, um, what's the word I want? Um, installations. And an artist will present their work. And, right. So um, it, it, it's, it's taken on a case-by-case -case basis what's necessary. And so there's no, if you sign up, it's not just you take what you get. There's a negotiation as to what each city might want and can handle. Yeah. Right. So it's not like an exchange student who just Right. Just right. It's a, it's a, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. Oh, shit. Right. Um, there's, a, there's, a, um, there's a negotiation and a matchmaking kind of a thing. That's okay. Okay, so... Um, by 1996, several cities have joined the network. The organized political response to a very specific injustice is already underway. When Derrida enters the conversation, I mean, he's, he was in it from the beginning, but now he's making his address about this new charter. Right? Okay, so now, in response to this urgent and prudent response, it's already taken place, Derrida calls for further revision and reorganization. And he does it, let's say, in order to protect everything that, as Salman wrote, quote, sketches out a different world, different kinds of relations among people, giving form and voice to the invention of a different democracy, in order to protect all of that. Derrida charges the cities with carving out such an inscription, that is, with becoming what they're called to protect in order to protect it. Okay, so Rushdie's declaration, as we read, and the network's charter had charged the cities with preparing themselves to take in, to take in selected riders. But by definition, by definition, famous writers, I mean, by definition, one can only be under threat if they had a Somebody name. Knows, but, right. Exiled but identifiable foreigners, then. That's what we're talking about. Derrida embraces this charge. There's no doubt about it. He embraces it. However, he writes, the multiplicity, sorry, the victims of the multiplicity of menaces of acts of censorship or of terrorism, of persecutions, and of enslavements in all their forms are innumerable and nearly always anonymous. Indeed, he continues, even to cite the best known cases of state, 
and non-state persecution would risk sending the anonymous others back into the darkness from which they find it hard to escape. A darkness which is truly the worst in the condition for all the others. That's on page six. So Derrida is zooming into the broader context of the network's mission. Um, and that would be the infinite responsibility that's both betrayed and actualized by the network's establishment. And what Derrida is doing is refusing the famous writer any particular privilege. He instead charges the cities of refuge basically with becoming cities of refugees. I was just, I'm sorry, I was just watching to uh, an internet, international cities of refuge network, uh -huh. which are only uh, for writers. No, oh, yes, and we're going to get that. very clearly, this is not an organization. They sit here down, not for, for refugees. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, only for writers. We're going to get to what happened. Yeah, yeah we're okay. going to get to what happened. It's not a refugee organization. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, in big block letters it used to. Is it still in call caps? Well. Okay. Okay, so but what Derrida is charging the cities to prepare to welcome those anonymous others for whom no preparation is adequate. So as we're, you're beginning to no, no doubt know, Derrida affirms this double charge everywhere. Right? Insisting on the one hand, and I'm going to pull this from um, of some of his other seminars on hospitality. He's right. So he insists on the one hand that hospitality must, quote, wait for the other. It must extend itself toward the other, extend it to, to extend toward the other the gifts, the sight, the shelter, and the cover. It must be ready to welcome, to host, and shelter. It must prepare itself and adorn itself for the coming of the host. It must even develop itself into a culture of hospitality, multiply its signs of anticipation, construct and institute what one calls structures of welcoming, which is what he's going to define the city as, by the way. A welcoming apparatus, close quote. But on the other hand, he continues, and in contradistinction to both Kant and Rushdie, the opposite is, quote, simultaneously and irrepressibly true. To be hospitable is to be ready to not be ready, if such is possible. To let oneself be overtaken to not even let oneself be overtaken, to be surprised, hello, in a fashion <laughs> almost violent, violated and raped, stolen, precisely where one is not ready to receive. Not only not yet ready, but not ready, unprepared, in a mode that is not even that of the not yet. After all, the awaited hope, thus invited, anticipated there, where everything is ready to receive him or her, is not a hope, not an other as hope. I guessed, close quote. This is everything you got out of, of, of hospitality, right? Um, this is the issue. You both have to be ready and you can't be ready. You both have to be um, an extend an invitation and be ready for the uninvited. Be ready to not be ready, to not be prepared, to receive whatever and whoever shows up, and yet to protect your limits enough so that you continue you can continue to receive. Impossible, abhorrent. Formally limiting the hospitality practiced by the network cities to famous writers who are chosen and invited already 
removes the choice from the realm of decision. And so from the realm of justice. As we've already seen, it's in the tension, in this unsolvable antinomy between the conditional and the unconditional, Derrida proposes that responsibilities and decisions have to be taken in practice. So here he's situating the cities right there in this terrible and traumatizing space of the decision. That is to say, the space of the undecidable, where no horizon, no ultimate horizon or existing law or precedent can dictate a proper response. In the paper machine, Derrida writes, justice requires that one calculate the risks, yes. <laughs> but it also requires that one not shut the door on what cannot be calculated, meaning the future and the foreigner, close quote. That is, the, one cannot become deaf, deaf to the imprudent demand of infinite responsibility that serves as the inspiration for any prudent response. And Derrida writes, that's the double law of hospitality. It defines the unstable place of strategy and decision. So Derrida's new charter calls on the network cities to occupy this place of strategy and decision. So the radically democratic charge that Derrida gives to the cities is to remain in the space of constant negotiation between the prudent and the imprudent, to be responsible for calculating and managing the risks which are real and profound, right, while simultaneously resisting the urge to slam the door on the incalculable, the unmanageable, the foreign. Okay, so the new charter that Derrida is talking about whatever it is, um, articulates the infinite responsibility to the others, and so the contradiction that is the condition for any political and ethical dilemma. Now, he doesn't call on the cities to throw open the doors and invite everybody in. Why not? It sounds so nice. Because it's impossible. Why? The borders would it would dissolve and would no longer be able to function as well, a well we're, yeah, I mean yeah. it can it can no longer be a host, right? Yeah. Then you can no longer invite anyone. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Which is 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 that problematic? I mean if we come back to the the, the, the pre originary place, there's never enough. Right. I mean this is a good reason. But is losing your ability to become a host? the worst possible outcome, and, you know? Well, only if, if, if um, it, it would mean that you would become impotent to make, to offer any sort of anything. In offering everything, you lose your ability to offer anything, right? It's not yours to offer. That's right. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you've all been in that situation where you've invited somebody, let's say, along with you in a car to go somewhere, and then they invite six other people, <laughs> right? And then suddenly, I mean, so you understand that feeling of, wait a minute, you know, first of all, my car is a two-seater, second of all, right? And, and so that, that sense of you've lost your ability to really do anything, because um, <laughs> here comes everybody again. Um, I guess that's the, that's the um, experience of being a parent, I mean, I only have dogs, so, um, but, but the, the, um, the experience of being a parent would have to be right where, where, where it's your home, and then suddenly this other person who's your child is inviting everybody in, right? Um, so that, that must be a weird experience of, of shared place, right? But, um, but you, you must be able to experience that in some sense in that dom on that domestic front. So what is the, so what does Derrida propose as, uh, how to define, um, you cannot receive everybody, you cannot 
it's, there's that impossible uh, universal hospitality in some way. So, does he offer any strategy to... That's the thing. There is no way to prescribe ahead of time some sort of, um, you know, uh, precedent or rule. The singularity of the only The only thing we can say is that each time it has to be negotiation between what's physically possible and um, in a finite situation and the unconditional imperative. So a negotiation between the unconditional and the condition conditions each time. That's what he wants the cities to do, be there each time. No, um, no prescriptives that would, that would make the decision ahead of time. No algorithm. No algorithm, no system, no systematic decision-making tool. Like in a court of law when you cite precedent. I just think that this is the most beautiful part if we extrapolate it from the specific situation of refugees or whatever. If we, sometimes we want authors to tell us if yes or no, and what Derrida always does is he never says yes or no. But if we take this as his biggest uh, advice, if we would really think that every time we are in that situation, that we, if we extrapolate it from the cities and we right. think that every time we are in a relation, we're in that situation, then what you were saying before, I'm just going to put it together, the response, the ability to respond, then really becomes responsibility right. and, and the ethical. Right. I, that to me was the one thing that, yeah. in, in these two things, because regardless of, of writers or the injustness and fairness that these people say that it's not for everyone or whatever, I think what underlines there is what is to be able to decide, or how is it that you can decide, right. Right. and then how is it that you take, well, you take responsibility for your, and then all the deliberation, I, I think this would give a lot of base to the theory of deliberation. Right. I agree. I, I just needed to, it was so beautiful. This idea of the flexibility and openness, I think, is incredibly important, because when I think about it, I mean, ultimately, Asylum-seeking refugees are relatively <coughs> lucky compared to, let's say, yeah. a woman or a child who's essentially property and is being smuggled around and sold, bought, sold, traded, abused. And it's like the refugees are just like, we're here, we just want to sign up, sign our name, here's whatever ID you might have. But like, yeah. In a word, isn't he just telling us to be athletic? No, I, I made me think. Athletic. Athletic. Mm -hmm. In how we receive these situations. Okay. I actually like that. Because <laughs> <Athletic. laughs> um, it's not just flexible, right? Yeah. It is flexible. It includes it's also flexibility. Strive, but it's alert, also yeah, strong, vigilant, yeah. attentive, endurance, endurance 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 clever, <laughs> clever. Yes, clever. Can you do that one more time so everyone can see? <laughs> 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 um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting that you said that you may be telepathic, because I was thinking about what an athletic event this is, I was watching Hamlin come in again like this, <laughs> it's, it's really, I mean, the space of a, you know, six hours of seminar every day in these little wooden chairs is also an pain. athletic event, it's, yeah. okay, so yeah, I would say yes, um, that's, that's a nice way to describe it. So he's not asking cities to just throw open the doors. That would be too easy, right? That's too easy. It's impossible, but it would be the easy. Th it would be easier, much easier, to be able to pick between the things you have to straddle. But what he is asking them to do is to affirm the limitlessness of responsibility. That any condition limits and betrays in order to actualize. 
So Derrida writes, it's a question of knowing how to transform and improve the law. This is on page 22 and 23. Quote, and of knowing if this improvement is possible within a historical space which takes place between the law of unconditional hospitality offered a priori to every other, to all newcomers, whatever, whoever they may be, and the conditional laws of a right to hospitality, without which the unconditional law of hospitality would be in danger of remaining a pious and irresponsible desire, without form and without potency, and even being perverted at any moment." Close quote. So what he says is necessary now, and this is on page 23, is experience and experimentation. I think Davis was, was that, is this the passage you were calling on the other day to yeah, talk about experience? Yeah, I think it's the spirit of what he's saying in general, yeah. though. Yeah, yeah. Right. The experience of these cities, he says, will not only be that which cannot wait, but something with, which calls for an urgent response, a just response, more just in any case than any existing law. An immediate response to crime, to violence, and, pers and to persecution. However, he also imagines, quote, the experience of cities of refuge as giving rise to a place for reflection, for reflection on the questions of asylum and hospitality, for a new order of law and a democracy to come to be put to the test, experimentation, close quote. With continued experience and experimentation, he writes, perhaps these new cities, quote, that would be something other than simply new cities, will contribute to another idea of cosmopolitanism. That's the hope. This is also Dos and Gattafi's refrain. I mean, that's their, those are their words. Yeah. Yeah. Something that sort of comes up for me in this is the question of how cities have the capacity to do this. He's saying, you know, we need to have this mm -hmm. capacity. But what does that, you know, practically, what does mm -hmm. that mean? Practically. Um, and I think that it, um, it calls for, um, and this works with the metaphor of athleticism, it calls for a kind of mastery mm. of the problematic at hand, which I think he lays the foundation for. You know, he's, he, he maps the broad, he asks the broad questions that would then from which would flow mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. secondary and tertiary, right. so on and so forth. But I mean, that's of interest to me. It's like, you know, how do you get from this yeah. invocation right. to the place of a kind of spry, yeah. um, just. Because most of it would have to go on under the radar, right? Yeah, because you yeah. thinking and talking. Yeah. Oh, sure, of course, of course. But to pull off, I mean, think about um, um, just just a few years ago, um, the federal decision to cut off aid to any city that continued to be a sanctuary city. Remember? Um, so that there was this threat to cut off any aid to any, what's a sanctuary city? Go ahead. I'm not asking. It's a sanctuary city is, um, is a city that um, doesn't actively ask if you're, what your immigration status is, right? So, so illegal immigrants can be there and report a crime, let's say. And the police can come, talk to them about the crime, they can tell them what happened, and there's no inquiry, right? Um, they're not actively asking for illegal immigrants to come in, but they're, not all, they're also not actively looking for them to get them out of there, right? Um, 
And so after 9-11, there was a question. I mean, immigration questions abounded, right? And one of the things that um, the, the, the feds wanted to do was then to say, well, if you want federal funding, you're going to have to stop that crap. It's, it's certainly, it's a largely impossible threat. Sure. I mean, when you really sure. think about right. it, schools, you can't hospitals, sign, roads. You can't <laughs> sign up as a sanctuary city, let's say. But that's what they were doing, right? People were, um, um, cities were, in a, in a very open way, sort of signing up as, a, as sanctuary cities to make a statement, right? And one of the things that, that in certain situations, in net, uh, the cities in this network would have to do is be very careful about what they advertised and what they didn't if they were going to reorganize state and city politics. So that's what I'm saying. Some of it would have to be, and on a case-by-case -case basis, some of it would have to be covert in order to get enough traction to have the strength to then make anything happen, right? And it, but if it was all covert, nothing would happen. Nothing would change. So there has to be, again, an incredible negotiation. Never. Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, like in New York a few years ago, the idea of giving illegal immigrants uh, driver's licenses and basic ID failed right. as some type of idea of some amnesty. It was really it's just like, well, let's just document more information about everybody, right. no matter how you feel about immigration. Right. right. But it just it didn't even go far. No. So, there, I mean, the question is well, everything's in question, depending on each particular situation, right? And Derrida wants each city to be capable of, of negotiating itself, each of these questions, each time, right? But is there a challenge? Because I feel like the level of intervention we escape the state by mobilizing the city creates an atmosphere where the city can be somewhat interpreted as it's either a neutral ground or or, or a context that has potential. I think about how liberal claims the city makes to take in refugees never, it almost obscures and hides all of the other unethical attributes and scenarios the city engages in that never produce refugees but continues to produce urban subjects or subjects that are subjected to the urban itself. And I mean, I think of the city as being you know, a phenomenally violent environment for a lot of people and I worry that, you know, sure, the Iraqi war refugee, you know, loves living in New York, but that doesn't mean that, you know, homelessness and property and all of these other urban issues have gone away for the people who are living in the city. And I don't necessarily want to get into a, a would you rather, you know, be a war refugee or homeless, but I do want to sort of maybe tease a little bit the idea that the preformed vegetable to capital urban environment will be utopian and under any situation I think that you know giving uh, illegal immigrants more documentation just makes a list of where they live so when you know, it's a liberal and <laughs> we know where they are you know it's sort of like it can be really nice but at the end of the day the winds change and it seems like the same people are always at the short end of the stick regardless of where they are there's no way to make a city utopian there's no way to make any way to tell in that sense. Um, and there's no claim that, that here that that could ever happen. Um, nonetheless, in order to make something happen, you start somewhere. And there's, and Derrida documents this, a long history of municipal hospitality. Um, which is not to say that there's also not a long history of municipal brutality. Right. But there is a long history of municipal hospitality that he's trying to document, and um, and <coughs> part of the of the um, possibility of the city has to do with its weird territorial boundaries, right? And that is, let me put it another way: it has to do with the fact that a city's identity is much more dynamic than, let's say, a nation states. Um, a city's identity is certainly defined by its territorial boundaries and borders, but it's also dynamically changing and deterritorializing 
um, depending on its, um, its events of hospitality, by the dynamic relations among its citizens, right? or its members, its inhabitants, let's say. Um, so it's both a space of territorialization and deterritorialization that makes it um, um, be, uh, makes it, it a possibility for a site like this, like the Derrida notes. What are the, um, Derrida notes that the um, Cities of Refuge got its name from the Book of Numbers, right? What happens is, I'm sorry. It's another horrifying story. It's another horrifying <laughs> story. Go ahead. Um, so actually, because you brought it up, and I was like, oh, this sounds really beautiful. I don't remember this actually happening. So I went and found a Bible. Um, so essentially, in the Mosaic Law, they're setting up these cities where if you kill someone, um, but not murder, because murder is punishable by death, but if, if you kill someone, um, you can go to these cities and they lay out where they are and how many of them live in the um, You can go to these cities, and within the walls of this city, no one can enact re retribution on you. The family of the victim cannot enact re retribution on you. But if you are found outside the walls of the city and you happen to run into the son of the dude you accidentally killed, yeah. you have no right to your life. That was about the law at the time, and that's why, um, according to the Book of Numbers, God asked Moses to establish six cities of refuge to begin with. And these cities, of, because the law was that you could exact blood vengeance. Yeah. And in fact, it was, it was sort of a responsibility, right, to avenge your loved ones. And so let's say, you know, I'm out there cleaning my gun, and you walk by and it goes off. I've killed you. I didn't mean to. I didn't. I'm responsible, but by negligence, right? I didn't murder you. I killed you, though. Nonetheless, your family has every right by law to come after me. So, because I'm guilty but not guilty, there needs to be a place for me. Right? That was this. So, cities of refuge. Six of them, God says, go make them, right? According to the book of Numbers. So the idea was that you were, now there's a lot, I mean, we could, if, Levinas has a long meditation on the, on the cities of refuge, and part of what he's trying to describe there is the situation, that's where we all are. Guilty, but not guilty. Sometimes really guilty, but, but at the very least, that the most innocent that we can be is also guilty. And by the very fact that we live in, let's say, a sanctuary city or a city that's both a sanctuary city and um, participating in the network of city of asylum, and but we have, you know, we have to, in order to get to our offices, we're stepping over the homelessness, uh, the homeless in the streets, let's say. Um, but not even in our city, but just the fact that we live in a in a in a world where this goes on, we're guilty. By the very, um, by the very fact that we benefit, right, and that, and so, so we're both innocent. It's not our fault, and you're and you're guilty. It's your fault. It's at least partially your fault, and you benefit from that from that issue. So one of the things that Levinas is pointing out is that none of us um, can um, make a sharp differentiation between the people who lived in the in the cities of refuge and ourselves. We all need them, is what he's saying. You know, we, all need to, we all need a city of refuge, in a certain sense. Um, okay, so, so what I was trying to say in response to Nick is that one of the reasons that the cities, um, people go back to the city as an idea um, for a potential shift and, and various rescue missions it has to do with this long history of the capacity to be molded in this way, which does not mean that you can never get a perfect city or a city that's not. I mean, remember, any idea of hospitality is already entwined with hostility, right? You're not going to get something that's just good 
<laughs> not an existence. So, um, but if, if it's possible to enact this in a city, why the hell not? <laughs> even if the city is still like even a site of evil in many ways. Okay, we have only a few minutes, so let me just note, um, and we'll, and, and next time we'll sort of get into a few issues in this text and get into um, um, the forgiveness text. But let me just note what happened. So um, what happened was eventually, I can give you the dates, um, between 2003 and 2005, the original network was dissolved and reorganized into two the Cities of Refuge North America, and the International Cities of Refuge Network. That's the one you want, ICORN. And this humanitarian effort um, undertaken by both is now, in fact, formally limited to the threatened rider who applies and is accepted by the network, a known foreigner, then, for whom the cities can prepare, etc. cetera. Um, and what I'm going to, I'm going to skip everything I was going to tell you, but I'll just say that when you read the histories, and you can find several of them online, you read the histories of these, of these new networks, they talk about the IPW, they talk about Rushdie, you can find a copy of the Declaration, um, and what you never hear is anything else about this address by Derrida or any new um, charter of hospitality. Gone like excised from the history of, of this organization, and now these organizations. Now, that doesn't mean, however, that, um, that what Derrida was calling for didn't in some ways find its way in. And I'm going to tell you why um, from ICON's site. Well, first of all, just the fact that they're still around. They got reorganized, they're still around. After 9-11, after the Patriot Act, all of this, this is still, the very fact that there are still organizations that um, operate in these ways, take in these threatened people, is still, that's astonishing, right? Given the crackdowns. Um, Patriot Act, the artificial elevation of color-coded threats, the challenge to sanctuary cities, all that, and still we have these two networks and these cities. Austin is one of them. Um, Strasbourg is still one of them. San Francisco is one of them. That they can still operate is pretty spectacular, right? Um, all right, and what that means is that the experience and experimentation continue. It's still alive. And even if the fragile hope associated with Derrida's vision still needs protection, the theoretical task destitute and vulnerable, remains and awaits refuge and political implementation. However, it's alive, this hope. And let me say why I say this. In its self-description, ICORN indicates that though it limits itself to one writer at a time, that's in quotes, that is a decision it has undertaken in the name of all the other writers, with, quote, each writer representing the countless others in hiding, in prison, or silenced forever. Close quote. The writer retains its privilege in this description, but the decisions about which writers to accept are taken against the backdrop of, the, of an impossible number of other writers. Right? Other others that the network can't accommodate, but for whom and to whom and in the name of whom they remain responsible. Right? So in that sense, Derrida's advocacy was successful in that sense. The negotiation continues, the experimentation continues. Right. You look very skeptical. Go ahead. <laughs> well, I mean, just the, the sort of the representation there as some kind of milk sap is just unpersuasive to me. Like, I don't, don't, I. What, what you mean? Well, the idea that taking one writer and doing so in a way that represents all the writers who are hiding in jail or silence forever, it's, is somehow satisfying or means anything at all. But it is, is well written. Is just to be abs absurd. I think I think you can only fine. You said you know, we take one writer. That's what we do. 
if this is just we are doing something, it's not nothing. We're acting within mm -hmm. you know, the scope of an impossible task, and what we're doing matters in and of itself. It's not sanctified or redeemed by representing. I mean, this idea that, <laughs> like, if I'm I'm, I'm in jail and, and you know and, and okay, can, no, no, you're, know, you're right. I get. I no, no. But, we yeah. would say, I mean, Derrida would still say, okay, so we've begun, let, we've only begun, right? And, and that's certainly the case. But the very fact that now they articulate this, that they articulate um, the, um, this sort of limitless responsibility yeah. is, is, um, is not nothing, yeah. right? That's not to say that the writer I, we take in, you know, covers for all those others, but it is to say that they're still around, still taking in one writer at a time, in these times, right? In these times, which is not, which is not nothing at all. They're still around, it's still possible, and the, and the inspiration is now inscribed in their, in their charter. So, in other words, what Derrida was calling for and that is to hold open this possibility, is it makes it still possible, the hope is still alive, right? The political implementation and protection still needs to come about, right? Um, so, we're, we're still facing the exact same limitations and conditions that Derrida was addressing in 1996. But, we've still got them. And all the progress that was made is still there, right? It's still there. So the hope is still there. What he was addressing is still there. A lot more needs to be done. A lot more needs to be done.